Hello again, everybody. I'm Roger Hoover. Glad to welcome you back to the Crimson Tide Sports Network and welcome to Crimson Drive. It's presented to you by Regions Bank. Make sure you order your new University of Alabama National Champions Visa check card and checks from Regions Bank, the official bank of the SEC. Just go to regions.com slash go Bama to order yours today. Well, I'm not in the studio today. If it looks like I'm in a hotel room, well, it's not a Zoom virtual background or anything like that. I really am on the road with the Crimson Tide. We're getting ready for Alabama's run in the 2021 SEC Women's Basketball Tournament. So today I'm with you from Greenville, South Carolina, as we get ready for Alabama's game tonight against Missouri in the second round and what we hope will be a really long run for the Crimson Tide in the SEC Tournament and then down the road in the NCAA Tournament. We'll be talking more with head coach Christy Curry about that coming up in just a few moments but now let's get into our headlines and we'll start with what is coming up today for you on Crimson Drive. Well, as I mentioned, we will have Coach Curry joining us to preview what's ahead for the Crimson Tide in the SEC tournament. Then a conversation with SEC Network basketball analyst Dane Bradshaw. He was on the SEC Network call the other night when Alabama defeated Auburn at Coleman Coliseum. He's seen Alabama a lot this season, so we look forward to visiting with Dane Bradshaw coming up. And then I mentioned the Auburn game, quite a victory for Alabama, quite a celebration as well on the floor at Coleman Coliseum. And even bringing the net to the podium, Nate Oates will have his press conference that he talks in the media with after the Auburn victory, so we look forward to that, as well as a preview of what's coming up this weekend for Alabama softball when we hear from the head coach of the Crimson Tide, Patrick Murphy. Let's take a look at the headlines, and we start with Alabama men's basketball. The Crimson Tide, of course, clinching the regular season championship on Saturday at Mississippi State, backed it up the next home game on Tuesday night, winning by 12 points against Auburn, 70-58 to at Coleman. Jaden Shackelford leading Alabama 23 points in that ball game, and then again, great celebration on the floor, getting to cut down the nets. Nate Oates spoke to the crowd. It was one of the most memorable nights ever in Coleman Coliseum, especially recently. And man, year two of the Nate Oates era already. Great moments like this for the Crimson Tide, and great moments in Tuscaloosa at Coleman Coliseum. So that was a fun way to close out the home basketball schedule. Now one more game left. The SEC added this game for Saturday at Georgia, 1 p.m. Central Tip off. Our coverage will start at noon across the network and it will come to you live from Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Tuscaloosa. You can join Chris Stewart, Brian Passing, and Tom Stipe for the watch party for Alabama against Georgia. In women's basketball, again, we're in Greenville, South Carolina, getting ready to start play in the SEC tournament. Alabama, based on an 8-8 eight eight record, it's back-to-back -back years Alabama has had an 8-8 eight eight record in conference play, so the Crimson Tide will be the number 7 seed. It's the highest seed Alabama's had entering this tournament since Coach Curry's first year back in 2014. It'll be the Missouri Tigers, the number 10 seed. They will be the opponent. Alabama had a good win against them earlier in the season to begin conference play, but lots changed for Missouri, lots changed for Alabama. It is really a fresh matchup to start Alabama's run in the SEC tournament. And if the Crimson Tide get a win today, they will take on the number two seed, the South Carolina Gamecocks, coming up tomorrow. Same tip-off as we have today, 5 p.m. Central here on the network. We also got the good news earlier in the week that Jasmine Walker was named to the first-team All-SEC team and then a second-team All-SEC selection, the point guard Jordan Lewis. So great honors for both of those young ladies, and we're certainly excited for what's ahead for Alabama women's basketball will be joined shortly by head coach Christy Curry. The Alabama baseball team, an interesting week in the midweeks after getting a sweep last weekend of Wright State on Friday and then Saturday had a double header sweep. Tuesday against UAB also was postponed due to rain, so at some point Alabama hopes to make up that game. That game was scheduled to be played at Regents Field in downtown Birmingham. They are hoping to make up that game at some point between the Crimson Tide and the Blazers, but the Blazers will make a trip to Tuscaloosa. Everybody, though, wants to see Alabama play in Birmingham against UAB, so stay tuned to RollTide.com for the latest on when, if that game will get made up. On Wednesday, the Crimson Tide did return to action and posted a solid win, 9-1 over Troy, as Connor Shamblin had a career-long outing, career-high in strikeouts, really was strong on the mound, and then this Crimson Tide team keeps hitting home runs. Peyton Wilson, Sam Prater, Zane Denton all went yard for the Crimson Tide. you got to love leadoff homers like we've seen from Peyton Wilson to begin the year for Alabama, so solid results there 
from the Crimson Tide sophomore class that's doing really well. Sam Prater, one of the veterans, he continues to lead this team. So certainly a lot of excitement for Coach Bo and Alabama baseball. This weekend, they will be in South Carolina, like I am, but they'll be in the low country. They'll be at the College of Charleston playing a three-game series. Friday to Sunday, we'll have all those games covered for you on the network. Crimson Tide softball team also back in action last night, defeated Mississippi State 4-0. And speaking of strikeouts, how about Montana Fouts getting a career-best 16 strikeouts in that game for Alabama. Just a really strong outing by Montana, and everyone was fired up to see the win at the Rhodes House as the pitching staff couldn't do any better right now. 28 innings in a row, Montana Fouts, Sarah Cornell, Crystal Goodman, Lexi Kilfoyle, anybody, the Crimson Tide throwing, not allowing runs, so that's great to see for Alabama. Now this weekend, they have a strong slate at once again at Rhodes Stadium, welcoming in Kent State, University of Northern Iowa, and then South Alabama for a Sunday matchup against the Jags. South Alabama, always one of the best mid-major softball program, so that's going to be a lot of fun coming up this weekend. Well, speaking of weekends, last weekend for the Alabama volleyball team, it was a sweep of Mississippi State, 3-1, to 3-1, to one, so winning both matches at home against the Bulldogs. Now this weekend, going on the road to College Station, Texas. Friday and Saturday matches coming up at Texas A&M. You can watch those on SEC Network+. Plus. For the great work against Mississippi State, Abby Marjima was named the SEC Offensive and the SEC Overall Player of the Week. And then Madeline St. Germain, the Libero, getting all those digs for the Crimson Tide in the back of the floor. She was named the SEC Defensive Player of the Week. Crimson Tide soccer team continues its spring schedule. At last Friday, getting a 1-0 victory against the Louisiana Raging Cajuns in Tuscaloosa. Taylor Carter had Alabama's only goal in the match. Now the Crimson Tide get ready for Montevallo coming up at 6 p.m. Central tonight at the Alabama Soccer Stadium. You can watch that on SEC Network+. Plus. And finally, the Alabama gymnastics team. Last Friday, a solid win against Arkansas. Again, by a slim margin, but still a solid performance by Alabama as Luisa Blanco won the all-around and the vault for the Crimson Tide. Now they're getting ready for the Florida Gators, 7.30 p.m. on the SEC Network. We're certainly excited for Coach Duckworth and what's ahead for Alabama gymnastics. Back inside the hotel room studios of the Crimson Drive, presented by Regions Bank, we are getting ready for Alabama's run in the SEC Women's Basketball Tournament after what's been a very solid year for the Crimson Tide. The resume has not been stronger getting ready for not only the SEC Tournament, but the NCAA Tournament in quite some time. So before this tournament begins, we had an opportunity to sit down with the head coach of the Crimson Tide, Christy Curry, to preview what's ahead in the SEC Women's Basketball Tournament. Joined now by Coach Curry as we get set for the SEC Women's Basketball Tournament in Greenville, South Carolina. And Coach, you got to be excited that another season essentially starts for the Crimson Tide on Thursday. Roll Tide. Absolutely. Roll Tide. We're excited. You know, I think um, this is the best time of year. It's what every coach and player plays for. And it's just really exciting the position our team has put ourselves in. When Alabama's playing at its best right now, what are the Crimson Tide doing both on offense and defense? Well, we're doing a great job in transition, you know, and, and we haven't played our best transition game as of late. We've got to look to find more ways to score early and often. Um, that's when we're at our best. And, you know, we've got to do a better job defensively of understanding some little things that we really need to clean up. So um, got to got to rebound. You know, uh, we, we were plus 10 against Arkansas. That, that was a great category. We have to continue to to really get easy baskets and, and rebound the ball well and and get critical stops. You know, every game in this league is so competitive. Um, there's not a moment to take off on the defensive end, and I think we're having some lapses we've got to clean up. What can you tell us about the consistency of your big three seniors, Jordan Lewis, Arai Copeland, and Jasmine Walker? Well, it's just the work they put in. You know, um, the way they come to practice, the way they prepare, and then the way they go out and execute. And they're experienced, you know. This, this, is, not, this is not an inexperienced league. And I think they've learned from their experiences. Um, they've really worked on some things that they understand what it takes to be consistent night in and night out. How proud of you the honors from the SEC for both Jasmine and Jordan? Just absolutely thrilled. You know, Roger, both are so deserving to be two of the top 16 players in this league. Um, to see what they've done for our team this year, to see the postseason opportunity. Um, it's, it's all because those two, along with Araya, have really embraced the challenge. You know, when they both came here, uh, they weren't scared of a challenge. And to see all their hard work for us to continue to grow and improve, um, those two deserve an awful lot of credit.
You got to be proud as well of this junior class coming up next year. We'll be talking about them a lot as the seniors that are leading Alabama, but these juniors took a big step forward this year. Boy, they sure did. How about Hannah Barber, you know, and Megan Abrams, just incredible. And um, what they're doing in our backcourt, uh, along with Jordan. And, you know, when you look at our junior class, I mean, Ruth Kong, that'll be a name you, I hope you say a lot on the radio a year from now. And then Brittany Davis, Brittany Davis is back in the gym looking awesome. So I think our junior class really has an opportunity to impact in a really big way. And, you know, we're really excited about the future. Uh, we love our two freshmen coming in and just a lot of good things happening. Of course, Alabama women's basketball has played well in the SEC tournament before in your time as Alabama's head coach. Just what are the keys to successful tournament basketball, in your opinion? Well, one game at a time. And I think that you're one and done mentality, you know, and when you look up and, and you're Jazz and Jordan and, and you think, we well, you know, I've only got two games at the most, you know, one in this this opportunity to win a championship and the one in the next one and nothing's guaranteed. So uh, the sense of urgency, you have to have a sense of urgency this time of year. And uh, everybody has to be on the same page playing their best basketball. To me, that's always been a joy as a coach to try to get everybody to play their best basketball this time of year. Now you're getting ready to head to Greenville, South Carolina for what we hope will be a very long week for Alabama. Just what can you tell us about uh, how the teams are staying safe with all the COVID protocols and kind of forming their own bubble in Greenville? Well, there'll be daily testing. Um, you know, we have to have a small travel party, which is unusual. And, you know, we have to stay in our bubble. So all meals, um, you know, everything is within um, a certain set of rules. So it's kind of the same routine we've had at home, to be honest with you. Uh, we're just going to take it on the road like we have all season. And, you know, the one thing I'm excited about, our team's been really good on the road this season. So uh, from how they've handled the protocols to how they've handled – the game time. So we're going to draw from those experiences and try and stay consistent. It's really important. Now is not the time, you know, for us to put ourselves in a position not to be safe. Well, and the parity in this league has been tremendous this year. I think maybe some people penciled in South Carolina when the year began, all of a sudden Texas A&M is your champion. I mean, you can look up and down the bracket. There are so many interesting matchups coming up this week. It's going to be a lot of fun for a fan to watch, you know, and as a coach, you're going to want to, you know, embrace it as a competitor and as a player. And so, you know, I think um, for any basketball fan across the country, um, you got to love it because it's nothing's given and everything's earned. And in this league, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch to see what happens in Greenville. Well, the first game is against the Missouri Tigers, and you get to start with a team we haven't seen since the very beginning of conference play. Just what do you remember about uh, that matchup in Columbia where Alabama got the win and then the team that Coach Pinston has right now? Well, much improved. I mean, a credit to Robin and her staff and her team for just fighting through. You know, they had had a lot, a lot of COVID, you know, and a lot of things had happened. And then, um, you know, we were real fortunate to get the win. It's a really hard place to play. Um, you know, it was a really good game. Um, Jordan was in a little foul trouble. So knock on wood, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Um, but our kids, you know, found a way to win down the stretch. Um, they're much improved, though, Roger. They're shooting the three extremely well. They're spreading the floor. They're playing a lot of five out. So they figured out who they are. And I mean, they're playing as good as anybody in the league. You know, everybody you talk to is like, well, I wouldn't want to play them. Well, I wouldn't want to play them. You know, and, and I don't, but at the end of the day, you just got to credit them because they've continued to improve, had a lot of close games here in the last eight games. And we're going to have to play our best basketball. But it is kind of fun because, you know, you get a chance to see somebody you haven't seen so frequently, it seems like, in a couple of instances. Well, we're excited for Alabama against Missouri in the second round of the tournament on Thursday, and then hopefully a long run after that for the Crimson Tide and Greenville. Coach, just thank you for joining us. Best of luck in Roll Tide. Thank you, Roll Tide. Our thanks to Coach Curry for joining us, and again, best of luck to the Crimson Tide. I'll be in Greenville as long as the Tide are here playing games, and we certainly hope it's an extended stay for me in this hotel room getting ready for women's basketball between Alabama and Missouri tonight, and then with the win, South Carolina, and then after that, who knows what could be in store on Saturday and Sunday as the Crimson Tide chase down an SEC tournament championship. Speaking of SEC championships, we've already seen the Alabama men's basketball team claim the SEC regular season championship. They did so by clinching that title on Saturday in Starkville, came home, backed it up against the Auburn Tigers on Tuesday night. And on the television call, along with Kevin Fitzgerald, was Dane Bradshaw, former Tennessee player. He joined me earlier this week to talk about what he's seen from Alabama and give his thoughts on the Crimson Tide heading into conference play in the SEC tournament. Dane, is this the vantage point you have for all the basketball games you've been calling this year for the SEC Network and ESPN? 
So, so I'm, I'm, uh, where I work is about 30 minutes away from Chattanooga. So I'm, I'm in the corporate setting right now. See, okay. and, and so if you can watch, I've had to angle it this way. Cause I've got nothing behind me. If I go like this, then it's just the hostage wall kind of look. <laughs> and I don't, you know, so th there's not a whole lot of like, like any man, uh, not a great decorator. So, um, I, my office is not filled with, with, uh, too much fluff, but th this is the best you got. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, um, working from home and honestly it's been a little bit easier than I thought I know from the viewer standpoint there's been some hiccups but um, we, we've had great support staff and for the most part pretty good connectivity and things of that nature some you know the the play-by-play -play and color probably stepping on each other a little bit more than it normally would because um, you just don't have some of that uh, non-verbal communication by being right next to each other but overall I, I think it, it's gone pretty well. Now, I was on the radio for the Auburn game, so I missed this, but I saw it bouncing around on Twitter. Did you have the kids on camera? Did you do a power ranking of your kids, something like that, the other night? <laughs> yeah, you know, everybody asks, you know, how is it working from home? Because I've got four kids in the house and this and that. And so this was one of, well, until they rescheduled for, uh, we've got a game Saturday, Missouri LSU. But going in, I thought, all right, this is going to be our last game of the year. Let me let me go ahead and uh, shame my kids a little bit, do a power ranking of, of who was best behaved and get some live live feedback from them so uh yeah we uh i put them all on uh on display there and shamed them and as i joked as, you know espn puts out like a little college basketball newsletter i said I, I will do anything to try to make the newsletter you know in terms of creativity even if it means sacrificing my own family's uh relationships <laughs> that's pretty funny well they got to make their appearance on tv during another great win for the crimson tide as alabama got a 12 point victory against auburn and dane i know you've called a lot of alabama games this year just first of all what impresses you the most with nate Oates' team yeah i'm, I'm a big believer uh, in alabama which is easy to say right now but it, Look, um, some people are, are leaning more towards Arkansas. And even though Arkansas beat Alabama, I, I think if there was a rematch neutral court, I, I'm still going with, with Alabama. And I've, uh, I've said that not not just to be a homer on your podcast, so to speak, but uh, I, I stand by that. I just, I'm a big believer in, in Nate Oates' system. And, and Auburn, even though they were shorthanded, I think was a good example of just how Alabama can stay in games even when they aren't a uh, thing of beauty offensively. They, they didn't really get anything clicking or much rhythm going until, you know, last six, seven minutes of that game where they put together a few buckets in a row. Um, but they showed that they can defend. And, and you know, when I, when I played, um, Coach Pearl would always challenge us because we were a good offensive team, and he'd call us out. And then he, the phrase was always, don't let your offense dictate your defensive intensity. In, in other words, just because you make three threes in a row, don't let that elevate your defensive intensity. And if you miss three threes in a row, don't let that drop your defensive intensity. And I think Alabama has done a phenomenal job of that. Um, you know, I, I think it was John Petty. I think he missed a dunk last game or there was, there was some, it was, am I correct? It was a dunk. Yeah. 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 He missed a dunk and I didn't have a chance to comment on it, but he misses a dunk. And one thing that impressed me though was, man, that guy sprinted back and he got in front of, of the, uh, of the Auburn player. And they, he just got back in transition defense as if it was a normal play. But the fact that he didn't hang his head, he didn't salt. I mean, that, that's the maturity that you see, and that's what you want to see out of your, your senior guy. And a guy like John Petty, where, you know, up and down, you know, throughout his career a little bit, but to see that level of, of passion and energy outside of just making threes, I thought was, was kind of an, um, a play that could go unnoticed. What makes Alabama's offense so hard to defend for these teams? Is it just how fast they're trying to get three-pointers up, how quickly they move down the floor? What makes it so tough for opponents to defend? There's a lot of teams that want to take shots at the rim and shoot open threes. And that, you know, but, but Nate Oates, they know exactly where they're going to get them, get them, how they teach it in the offseason, and just their commitment to that strategy. But I think probably the biggest thing is, they have a commitment to making sure they have five guys on the court that can all do that. Um, the uh, sorry, who's, who's your big man that uh, transferred to Mississippi State this year from last year? Javian Davis. Javian Davis. Yep. Good example. A good, solid big man in the SEC that could have some success. However, was he ever going to be a pick and pop, take two dribbles, find a shooter like a Jordan Bruner or Alex Reese? Probably not. And so, the commitment to the personnel side, I think, is so important because, you know, letting Javion Davis go, 
to somewhere else in the SEC, uh, I thought is a tip of the hat to, to NATO to saying, look, you're a better fit over there for us and what we need to have five guys on the court at all times. They are not going to um, have their offense be held hostage by one player that doesn't have the same skill set or at least close to the same skill set as the other four guys on the court. And that's what makes them so hard to guard is because you have to close out um, uh, even on Alex Reese and Jordan Bruner. And, and of course, everybody knows all the other guys. But I, I think, um, look, they're, they're the best at it. But what allows them to be the best at it is because it's not just three guys on the court that challenge the defense. It, it's all five. Not to talk too much Tennessee days uh, back for you, but there are some real parallels, Dane, to your time in Knoxville, plus what Herbert Jones, John Petty, Alex Reese have gone through at Alabama, having a coaching transition kind of midway through their careers. And then with the new staff coming in, having success in the first couple of years, just what kind of buy-in does it take to have the maturity to buy into what the new coaches are trying to tell you? And then how rewarding is it when it does pay off like it has for these guys, certainly did for you at Tennessee? Yeah, well, you, you've been humbled in the first couple of years of your career. Um, you're, you're hungry and you want to be coached and you want to get a taste of, of victory from that new coach. Um, I think one thing that has actually probably helped Alabama this year, um, in my first year when Bruce Pearl came, we had immediate success. We got a two seed his, his first year. But that success happened so quick for us. And we did we overachieve a little bit? Maybe did we, we peaked a little bit too early. We, I mean, we weren't playing like a two seed to end the year, but my point on all that is you've never had a target on your back. Uh, you've never had this much media attention. ESPN's following us around at the NCAA tournament. All these things are going on and, and there's a fatigue factor there. Like, Oh my gosh. Like when you just are, you know, the surprise team. Whereas the fact that even though this has been quick success, I think being in year two, these guys are more mature to handle it. Um, I think they've, you know, the exhaustion and fatigue from all the media attention, it's kind of slowly come along as opposed to, oh my gosh, Nate Oates out of nowhere. Like everybody kind of saw it last year trending up, didn't have the exact year, expectations were high, they've exceeded them. But I think it's just been a, a, a nice gradual process for them. And they've got so many seniors and upperclassmen that I think they've, they've handled the attention really well. A couple setbacks here and there, but um that, that's one thing that I think is always underrated is, is when you're sort of a surprise team of the year, just how sort of the uh, exhaustion can be of, of all the hype and media attention and things of that nature that, that uh, you know, when they say act like you've been there before and you're like, well, we had been here before, so I don't really know <laughs> how to take it calmly. From your vantage point, what's going to be the toughest part of postseason basketball for this team? Because I think there are a lot of Alabama fans that are worried that there could be just a random day in the SEC tournament, the NCAA tournament, where the three-pointers aren't falling, and Alabama is going to be really vulnerable to having a great season end abruptly. Just what's most important to try and make sure that that doesn't happen for this team? I think they can still make the Sweet 16 if their offense is teetering a little bit just because of their defense and, and the seating is going to help them. But there's no question for them to make a historic run. Their offense has to get back to where they were one of the top five, 10 offensive efficiency type, efficiency type teams in the country. Um, look, to me, if they get a matchup where there are just some bulldog on ball defenders, some good size, like you've seen at Mississippi State, not a great team this year. But, man, they've given Alabama some problems. They're, they just have good length on the perimeter. They guard the ball well. They, they slow the game down, um, big physical guys down low. And, yes, Alabama's won those games. But if you get um, an, an NCAA tournament team-type Mississippi State roster, that, that could cause them problems. But um, I've said this a couple times here recently. I would expect Alabama's offense – to reignite in the NCAA tournament more than the SEC tournament because the familiarity, I mean, these teams have played Alabama a couple times now, maybe a third time in the SEC tournament, and, and you learn by doing. Um, whereas in the NCAA tournament, yes, there's all this film on Alabama, but you don't really know just how well they space the court, how hard they attack the rim, how well they can make contested threes, you know, hand down, man down stuff until you actually get in the fire. And I, I think Alabama um, could, I, I could see them in the first weekend averaging over 80 points and really exposing some teams and, and getting their offensive confidence back. 
just because uh, these teams hadn't had the benefit of, of being on the same court as Alabama this season, the way the SEC teams have. Dane, we'll finish with this. Uh, what does it say about the long-term prospects for this program that Nate Oates has won the SEC regular season title in year two, and even before that happened, signed a contract extension, got a raise to make sure he'll be in Tuscaloosa a lot longer. Just what does it say about the commitment you're starting to see from Alabama towards men's basketball? Yeah, times have changed. I don't think these coaches that want to win a national title or get the big payday, they realize they don't have to go to a blue blood school to do that now. You know, the, the history of those schools helps, you know, the Kansas, the Dukes, the North Carolinas, all that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, they've got a passionate fan base and all due respect to them. But you can accomplish what you want as a coach and you can recruit the way you want for the most part as a coach at a place like Alabama and the overall commitment from the SEC has, has been phenomenal. I remember Tom Crean at Georgia, um, one of the big parts before he took the job at Georgia, a lot of his conversations were with the SEC office, you know, and what's the commitment from the conference towards men's basketball. And that sold him as much as anything on taking the job at Georgia because of the fact that, Hey, we, we, we're going to compete at a high level. We do it in every other sport in the SEC and it's, it's been a it's been a gradual process, you know, the, the commitment to facilities, making sure teams are scheduling the right way. Um, and sometimes the, the national media would laugh at the SEC a little bit because the rebuilding process wasn't starting to show results yet. But then as more coaches came in, they got into year three, four five, whatever it might be. Now you're starting to see the, the quality and the depth of the SEC and, and the coaching man. Uh, when we talked to Coach Pearl before that Alabama game, he's been in the league 13 years now, Tennessee, Auburn. He said that, look, there, there's just no question top to bottom. This is the toughest uh, the, the, the opponents coaching have, have been since he's been here. Last thing, and I'll let you go, Dane. Uh, what is it about Coleman Coliseum for opponents that can be tough? Because sometimes you were on some really good Tennessee teams that would come in and Alabama and just have a tough day shooting. And obviously a lot of that has to do with Alabama's personnel during those years. But what was it about Coleman that sometimes would be tough? For us, a lot of times it, it was the – the talent. I mean, it was that simple. I mean, I, I remember, um, gosh, you, you, ha you had Kennedy Winston. And for me, I played high school basketball with, with Ernest Shelton. And, uh, and to be on the other side of it wasn't fun. I know he wasn't the star player for Alabama, but, you know, for two years in high school, it was always get Ernest the ball. It was only a matter of time before he went on basically a, a 9-0, 12-0 run by himself, multiple threes. And, and to be on the defensive end and seeing him go off, uh, and the crowd going nuts. It, it wasn't fun on the other side of it. Uh, Ronald Steele was a guy that was um, a problem for us. So uh, let's see, I guess we only had, we were 0 2 down there, um, but none of the games ever felt very close. So it, look, the, the talent's there. And, you know, I was on LSU, uh, an LSU radio show the other day, and they said, you know, are you surprised at how, how well Will Wade's been able to get them in the top four and all that? I'm like, man, when, it depends on what era you played. Like I played when Alabama was really good and when LSU was really good. So if you've seen it before and you know, the talents there and the recruiting base is there, you're not surprised when a good coach is able to come in and put it all together again. And I think that is for a lot of sec schools when they say, Oh, I don't know if you can win at basketball. The fan base is like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Yeah, we can. Right. Now we might not have a sellout stadium until you have a good roster, <laughs> but we'll show up if the product's there and, and the product's certainly there now. Well, Dane, thank you for joining us. Give us your thoughts on Alabama basketball. Really appreciate it. All the best with uh, any broadcast suit you have coming up, but just thank you again. Same to you. Thanks a lot. Our thanks to Dane Bradshaw for joining me as he got to see Alabama defeat Auburn again 70-58 to in Tuscaloosa on Tuesday. And after the ball game is over and after the great celebration that was had on the floor with the Crimson Tide players and staff cutting down the nets at Coleman Coliseum, it was Nate Oates bringing the net with him to the post-game press conference as he met with the media following the... All right, everybody, as you can tell, we are joined by head coach Nate Oates right now. Uh, they're going to frame him up. Uh, just while they're doing that, just a reminder, use a raise hand function to ask a question, and we'll get your questions uh, at some point in time. Looks like he's framed up as he's going to be, so let's go ahead and start. We'll start with uh, Drew DeArmond first. Yes, coach, I just wanted to 
get your thoughts on uh, the Jaden Shackelford's performance, especially in the second half, made a lot of big shots, uh, and also the defensive performance as a whole uh, against Auburn tonight. Yeah, I, you know, it was great that Shaq started making shots. You know, he works so hard. He's in the gym. He's a great kid. Just keep telling him to take open shots, you know, and he, he, he took them. You know, it was great. You know, five of nine from three, finally got himself going. So, you know, maybe we can get some other other shooters going, follow, follow up with him. But really happy to see uh, his performance. I thought he played pretty uh, pretty good for us uh, tonight. We needed it offensively. We, we A lot of guys struggled offensively again tonight. But then the defensive performance, I mean, our defense has been carrying us for a good month now. So, you know, I can't say enough about, you know, the job our guys are doing job Charlie's doing with the defense. They, uh, shoot, I think we had them. What do you have them for? Uh, a 0 0.85 on defense, which is pretty good. You know, we turned them over a lot. They had 23 turnovers. The, the, the only issue was the uh, defensive rebounding. We gave up way too many old boards. But if you look, you know, they only had four second chance points. So when we did give them up, we did a decent job still getting a stop after that. So. Got to clean up the rebounding a little bit, but I thought over overall our defense was great tonight. Go to Tony Sukalis next. Now you kind of just talked with the defense, but uh, there was a time during the first half where you kind of gave uh, John a, a high five after he saved the ball. Just what did you see from his effort uh, today on the court? Petty, you're asking. What do? Yeah, you know he saved that 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 ball going out of bounds. You gave him a high five. Oh, well, no. What did you, you see from his effort? Listen, his, his effort's been great. I, I just – I can't say enough about how hard Petty's been playing. The, uh, you know, I sat down with him um, eight games ago now and talked to – you know, we get these offensive leverage, defensive leverage numbers, you know, trying to get him to be the best two-way player, you know, one maybe in the country, you know, he's offensive player of the week, you know, not not too long ago. So I really challenge him on the defensive side. He's got our best defensive leverage over the last uh, eight games. When, when they, they came up with it, you know, it was the last seven before this came, and I think he was really good uh, on the defensive side again tonight. So I just like his effort, his attention to detail, him being locked in on the defensive end. You know, he, he's yeah, like our, he was a .84, which is pretty solid on the defensive side. So he's probably still our leader in defensive leverage over the last eight games. So I. I been really proud of his effort. You know, we want him to get a little bit more aggressive on offense. I think he, he can be. I thought he was at times tonight. You know, we uh, we got him that dunk to start the game, and then he hit three threes, so that's good. You know, maybe we can get him and Shaq back uh, rolling again, making some shots. Cecil Hurt, you're next. Um, bringing Jake Q off the bench continued to seem to, to work for you. Josh was a little slow starting again. Um, what, what have you seen from JQ these last three or four games? I mean, he comes in and gives us a spark as soon as he gets in. The uh, speed of, speed of the game goes up. We play fast to begin with anyways, but then he's he's a jet. You know, he just adds a lot to it. This is the first game, I think, in 10 games that he has not shot 50% or higher from three. I think it was nine straight games where he was 50% or higher. So, you know, he didn't shoot it great today, but he played well. I mean, you look, you know, he may come off the bench, but he was – third in minutes or four, fourth, maybe fourth in minutes, but he's right there. I mean, Herb led us with 33 minutes and Shaq was 31, Petty's 31, and JQ's right there at 29. So, you know, he, he may come off the bench, but he's in there when we need. He led the team in plus minus at plus 14 when he was in today. So I thought defensively, offensively, I think he's been playing uh, really well as well. Let's go to Michael Casagrande. Yeah, that moment after the game, cutting down the nuts, speaking to the crowd, what was that mean to you in just your second year to be able to do that? I mean, it was great for our guys, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, Reese had tears in his eyes. You know, he's Alabama kid that this means so much to her, Petty. You know, Bruner comes in. You know, when we recruited him, I mean, we sold him on how special we thought we could be with him in the mix. So. You know, those four seniors on scholarship, add in Tyler Barnes. And, I, you know, I, no matter what year it is for me, I, it, it should be about the kids. You know, I, I can coach for a long time. I'm still pretty young. Hopefully I'm coaching for another 20, 25 years. They, they only get 
one chance at this thing. So to me, it's more about them, you know, what they're getting out of it. And just really, really happy to see the excitement, the joy, the everything on their face. You know, you could tell how emotional Reese was, and I was happy for him. So it's great for them to be able to cut the nets down. I just, you know, it's unfortunate we can't pack the uh, arena out, but it's nothing we can control. So it's nice that all the, ah, shoot, it looked like 90% of the crowd stayed for the end. So that, it was great. I thought it was great for our guys. Okay, we got three more questions, so we're going to wrap it up with these three. Let's start with Joe Goodman first. Hey, Nate, uh, what's the identity of this team compared to your past conference championship teams? It's a good question. I uh, shoot the identity of my teams have been pretty similar, to be honest with you. Uh, the ones that have won it, I mean, they're kind of tough, gritty, hard nose. I'll say this, I mean, we're a better defensive team than I've ever coached to be top three in the country. I'm not sure what we are. We might have jumped up tonight with our performance, but, you know, we've been top five in the country for pushing two months, I think, now. So I think, you know, as much as anybody wants to talk about our analytics on offense and threes and all that, shoot, this team's been the best defensive team I've ever coached. So, you know, we've kind of hung our hat on defense and we're still playing you know, a style that fits how we wanted to play coming in here. But offense has not been our uh, strong suit here well, basically in February and March so far. So, you know, we've had a couple games where we played better, but we've really hung our hat on the defensive end, getting stops, and then really winning games on the defensive end. Let's go to uh, Drew DeArmond next. Coach, I wanted to ask you about Juwan Gary and his return. His energy seems infectious. He always gives you a, a great effort. Uh, his body language is always so good on the bench. Of course, everyone's is. But uh, he was really excited after the game, embracing with uh, Aaron Jordan and the players. But is is he earning more minutes in your mind in the postseason with the way he's played? I mean, we put him in. And we went on a big run there at the end. I, uh, you know, when, I don't even know how many minutes he had till the very end. I know he played 12 minutes and he was plus 12. We were plus 12 when he was in for those 12 minutes. I think at the end they had cut it to five, if I remember right, with just over eight minutes to go. I think uh, I think JP maybe hit a three to kind of blow it from five to eight there. And I think Jawan was in that whole run. You know, we got him in just – you know, he's a little smaller, but he plays so hard. He got some old boards, some putbacks, got some defensive stops. So I think I think he was in. We had like a 17-5 run over like six and a half minutes, and I think he was in for that whole run. So, shoot, you know, teams that give us good opportunities to match up, you know, where he can play those type of minutes, you know, shoot, we probably need to play him a few more minutes, to be honest with you. I mean, he's, you know, if you look, he plays 12 minutes, and he has four offensive rebounds in 12 minutes. I mean, the team had 12 for the whole game. He had double what anybody else had. So just his effort on the glass just goes a long ways. I mean, some of those threes we hit off the second chance. I mean, look at our second chance points. We had 12, Albert and only had four, even though they had more offensive rebounds than us. But, you know, Wani gets them, gets that one put back on, on the miss. He got a rebound where I think Shaq hit a three off it. So his effort was great. Really, really happy for him. All right, we, we got actually two more, Cecil Hurt and then uh, Scott Griffin. So let's go with Cecil first. Um, Coach, I'm assuming you'll take a day off tomorrow. And do they emotionally need that, do you think? It's been a, it's been a long week, a tough week. And do you think they need a day away from it? Yeah, I'm giving them a day off. and. They need to, they're going to come see the trainer and get some treatment. Other than that, just get out of here and stay away from basketball. Rest your mind, your body. Even Thursday and Friday, I'm not going to try to kill them. I mean, we got to get the Georgia scout in, but, you know, we've played them once. I'm not, we're not going to overdo it. We, we just, we got to get back to making some shots. Like, making shots goes a long ways to helping your offense out. I mean, you look, we had a season low in turnovers and we still, we still weren't very good on offense today just because we shot under 30%, you know, or under 40%, I'm sorry, under 30 from three. So we'll probably do a lot of shooting on Thursday and Friday. 
along with getting the scout in. But yeah, they're taking tomorrow off. I can't take the day off. I got, I got my schedule packed with a million things. It seems like the more you win, the more they, they slam on your schedule around here. But the players will be off for sure. All right, last question, Scott Griffin. Nate, I thought it was your best defensive start of the year. Um, you can talk about that if you agree with that. And then also, did you see the defense that this team is playing now when you got here two years ago at the beginning of this year? Could you, did you see the potential? Look, Herb Jones is one of the best defenders. He's probably the best defender I've ever coached, to be honest with you. I mean, with his length, athleticism, toughness, reactions, all of it. Then when Petty really started to guard, you know, I, I, those are two uh, key pieces to having a great defensive team. So could, did I think we could be like top five in the country? I, I don't know about that. That's hard to get to. But I, I thought those two were a great start. Adding a kid like Bruner, who's got such a high IQ and understands basketball at a high level, I thought that this year, I, I, you know, Primo's got size. Keon Ellis, I knew, could be a great defender. Shaq's really bought into guard, and Quinterly's quick. You know, our, our pieces line up. Juwan Gary's athleticism and size. Rojas, you know, you can switch. He's tough. You know, you kind of go down the, the line. You've got, got that. I, top five in the country defensively is probably a little farther than I thought we could do, but I certainly, we were trying to be top 30. We, we were not going to be happy with anything less than top 30 after we were 114th last year. So, yeah, it, the defense, I, I thought we could be really good. I didn't know that we'd be this good. Uh, best defensive start to a game, probably for us here at Alabama, this was probably the best one. I mean, they, I don't know what they had after the first couple of media timeouts, but they were struggling to score the ball. We were turning them over a lot. I thought we were really locked in. You know, we had a pretty good start offensively, too, you know, with the, the dunk and the three, and then I, I just would have been nice if we could have blown it open a little bit more than we did uh, with how good our defense was. But it is what it is. We're going to control what we can control. I thought we controlled a lot of stuff that we should be controlling outside of the rebounds. But our effort, our defensive intensity was at a pretty high level tonight. All right. Thank you, Coach. Alex. Roll Tide, the great performances we've seen from Nate Oates and the Crimson Tide men's basketball team winning the SEC regular season championship. And already in softball, maybe they're starting to think about an SEC championship again for the Crimson Tide. They did win the title back in 2019, did not have an SEC champion last year. So you could say the Crimson Tide are the reigning champions in SEC softball. And Patrick Murphy's team is playing at such a high level already to begin the season. And earlier in the week, had a chance to meet with the media to preview what's ahead for the Crimson Tide. This was taped before. Alabama played Mississippi State on Wednesday in Tuscaloosa, but still a great weekend's ahead for the Crimson Tide at home. And here is Patrick Murphy previewing all the softball action coming up for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Hope everybody's doing well this morning. Um, I'd really like to tell a story about Bailey Dowling, so she's still in the room. We went to Northern Iowa to play in 2013 after we won the national championship, and I'm from Iowa. Uh, Jaden Spencer was from Iowa, is from Iowa, and Kate Harris, our director of ops, are all from Waterloo, Iowa. So we go there, and the Dowlings drive up from Champaign, Illinois, to watch us play Illinois because they were in the tournament as well. And I think Bailey might have been in fourth grade or fifth grade. And in between our doubleheader that day, Jackie Trena, who's you know returning MVP of the World Series, first team All-American, she's making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the team, like outside the dugout. And Bailey sees that, and she's just enthralled that Jackie Trena, the star pitcher for Alabama, is making everybody's lunch. And on the way home, uh, it was about a six-hour car ride from Cedar Falls to Champaign. She started telling her mom and dad that she would love to play at Alabama. And then about, I think, two or three years later, I get a phone call from her high school coach saying, hey, there's a kid up here that's pretty darn good. You might want to watch her. And then it just kind of went from there. And um, it's just a, a strange um, story of 
how a kid ends up at a school. And we had Jackie Traina speak to this year's team on a Zoom about two or three weeks ago. And we also told her that story. So I give Jackie Traina credit for getting Bailey Dowling to Alabama. All right, we'll start the questions and we'll go ahead with Robert. Hey coach, um, you guys have had a dominant season thus far in the pitching circle. What type of mentality do you ask for your pitchers to have? I just think, you know, give us your best shot and whatever you have on that day, give us 100% of X, Y, Z. And, you know, just after the game on Sunday, I think it was, um, you know, we were like, you guys really need to just relish the shutouts because I don't care who you're pitching against nowadays. The athletes are better. The bats are hot. The ball is hot. I mean, the whole, the whole thing about softball is more offensive oriented right now. And to throw a shutout in a Division One game is pretty dang impressive. And, you know, the, and the defense needs to, you know, they're, they got a huge hand in that. The catcher, it's called a battery for a reason. You know, the pitcher and her are together. Uh, give credit to Stephanie Prothrow for, for calling the game, for throwing a shutout. Uh, but it's special, you know, and we can, when, and even in a doubleheader sweep of North Carolina, where I think it was four to nothing, two to nothing, that's, that's a lot of innings of shutout ball. So want that shutout, you know, really, really like be greedy with the ball and don't give up a run. And that obviously it, you can't give extra outs. So the defense has to play well too. So I think it's a, uh, uh, that mentality is really good right now for our pitching staff. Go ahead, Brett. Hey, Coach. Bailey expressed the team's excitement to get finally going with the SEC games this week, and then once you're done with next tournament, get full into the SEC. Uh, speak on your excitement to get into the SEC and what you kind of need to work on in these next final week and a half, so to speak, to get ready for this onslaught of SEC. Well, I think, uh, you know, looking at some of the stats, we just need – we need a little bit more offensive production from everybody in the on the team, you know, just a just a little bit more. Nobody has to hit a thousand, but just just a little bit more. Getting on base, taking a walk. Uh, I thought we had four or five walks that we could have had against Troy on Sunday that we swung at a pitch and either popped up or struck out. And you know, sometimes that's the quality pitcher too, and they had a good pitcher going. So. Um, just take what they give you. So if they get they if you get a walk, you take it. Um, and just little little things that we need to clean up. Um, you know, we had a couple of errors that weren't really tough plays that we need to make. So, you know, our base running could be better too. I think our our leads aren't as good as they can be when we steal. I noticed that on a replay. So we're going to work on that for sure. But it's exciting to you know. We got to play LSU twice, and now we get to play Mississippi State, you know, and the weather's supposed to be good. I know they're going to have a really good team. They have a deep, deep pitching staff, and they have two of the best power hitters in the country on their team, and they hit back-to-back -back in their lineup. So it's, it's going to be a fun night. Go ahead, Katie. You kind of with the closing there just got to my question, but I was going to talk about Mississippi State's power hitters. Um, we just talked about relishing the shutouts. So um, what's the kind of preparation for – the pitching staff knowing that you got some big power hitters coming in on Wednesday? Well, you can't be afraid to go at them, you know, because if you're afraid to go at them, you're going to throw something right down the middle of the plate. And you really can't afford to walk them because obviously they hit back to back. Uh, but they've got a strong lineup up and down. Uh, they, they played well over at Texas. Uh, they gave Texas a heck of a good game. I think it was an eight to seven game when Texas came out. But, you know, state threatened a ton. Uh, they're a team that really never gives up, so you can never count them out. Uh, we have to pitch well. We have to play great defense. We can't give them extra outs. And then offensively, we need to adjust to whatever they do in terms of pitching because they have six ladies on their staff. They have a lefty and five righties. And if they switch a pitcher, we have to attack the next one. And I think too many times we have let the reliever get – um, you know, into a groove 
And then, you know, you look up at the scoreboard and it's four innings later and it's zero, 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 zero. And we let the reliever kind of um, get us. And we need to make sure that whoever they pitch and if they switch, we need to make adjustments quickly. So, uh, you know, like against Texas, they use three different pitchers. So we need to be ready for that. Go ahead, Brett. Hey, Coach, you talk about it all the time, and you mentioned it earlier in your opening statement. You can go two, maybe three deep at each position. 14 games in the season now, do you kind of have an idea or a mindset what you kind of want in each position, or is it is it a lefty-lefty matchup? Is it who's hot? How does it kind of work? It, yeah, it could go that way. And, you know, what, what hurt us, too, is when KV and both KV and Jenna Johnson went down with injuries, and they're, they were basically starting from day one. So we've lost two starters. Um, but there's been some kids that have, you know, picked up right where they left off. You know, Cat Grill was on base three times in one game in the nine spot. You know, Maddie Morgan has continued to hit well. She's given us a really good shot. Um, you know, so some people have picked it up after those two uh, got hurt. But I think it's uh, – we're still looking at matchups in terms of who, who will be out there. Um, you know, State – Really likes the long ball. Uh, there's there's not as much team speed, so that could play a factor in who we play. Go ahead, Robert. Hey, coach. Um, Lexi Kilfoyle has just looked more locked in than she did last season. How do you think the extra months off have allowed her to strengthen her mental game? Well, I think last year, you know, one of the uh, tough games was against UNC that opening weekend. And we had UNC and Florida State. We played them twice. And we were up 8-4 to four in the seventh inning. And, you know, Kilfoyle was doing well. She had beaten them the day before. We brought her in, and then, boom, all of a sudden, we lose it 9-8. to eight. And I don't think that probably ever happened to her in summer ball or high school where, you know, it just, it just started to snowball. So those experiences last year have really helped her. And I don't know if you've noticed that she's, she's really, you know, at, at the end of the game, she's really done a good job of shutting somebody down and not giving them anything. And um, I think it helped her. She, she uh, obviously she's very talented. She's very hard to lift her pitches because she throws a heavy drop ball. She's got great off speed. You know, she hits her spots pretty well. I thought Sunday she only made one bad pitch. And that was the 0-2 to the uh, kid that hit the double. So she's just been really, really good. And, and you're right, her mental game has been on spot. Um, she hasn't gotten rattled yet. So kudos to her, and hopefully she's learning as she goes. Any other questions for Coach Murphy? We'll see you guys tomorrow night then, right? All right, thanks, guys. All right, thanks a lot. Great to hear from Coach Murphy, and best of luck in all the games coming up this weekend for Alabama softball, Alabama baseball as well. We have so much coming up for you on the network, so it's time to take a look at the weekend schedule before we say goodbye here on Crimson Drive. It starts tonight with women's basketball. Again, the second round SEC tournament matchup with the Missouri Tigers. 5 p.m. Central, our coverage on the radio will start five minutes prior to that here on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Then men's basketball. Back in action at Georgia for the final regular season game Saturday at 1 p.m. Central, a noon airtime. Make sure you arrive early to get a great spot at Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Tuscaloosa so you can listen to the broadcast, watch Chris Stewart, Brian Passing, and Tom Stipe also supply all the great crowd noise we're going to need once again for Alabama playing on the road at Georgia, trying to finish out the regular season really strongly. Alabama needs everyone they can get, even with the tournament tight or even with the regular season title clinch, still playing for the better seeding, so Alabama really needs to continue playing well at Georgia on Saturday in men's basketball. Baseball, it'll be a three-game weekend series against the College of Charleston, Friday at 5 o'clock, Saturday at 1, and then Sunday at noon to wrap up the weekend in South Carolina. We'll have radio coverage for all those games available on the network. Same could be said for softball. They're still at home in Tuscaloosa. Friday doubleheader against Kent State, and then you and I on Saturday, and then a great final matchup against South Alabama. Really looking forward to tuning into that matchup between the Crimson Tide and the South Alabama Jags to wrap up this weekend of Crimson Tide Athletics. 
So for one final time from the hotel room suite and studio for Crimson Drive presented by Regions Bank, this has been Roger Hoover. I just want to thank all of you for watching. And again, this show is brought to you by Regions Bank, the official bank of the SEC. Make sure you pick up your new University of Alabama National Champions Visa check card and checks from Regions Bank. Just go online to regions.com slash gobama to order yours today. Fun addition away from Tuscaloosa for the first time for this show of Crimson Drive. But I thank all of you for watching. Thanks to Ethan Carabin our producer for putting all of this together as well and now just sit back relax and make sure you have the Crimson Tide Sports Network ready to go because we have so much coming up not just tonight with women's basketball men's basketball baseball softball so much happening right now for Crimson Tide Athletics it's March there will be madness just enjoy all of it and Crimson Drive will be here for all of it so thanks again for watching the Crimson Tide Sports Network and Roll Tide everyone